Good evening, all. Online PG classes. We held every Monday on five to six thirty, and I'm very happy to share that it is being held regularly. And uh, there has been a hard response to these classes. I have been told that there is one login, and the that laptop is connected to the projector, and the whole PG class views the class. All of the PG students, and similarly, those who are not able to view because of the clinical postings or emergency duties, they do the same by watching it on the ISA website, ISA web dot in, or on the ISA YouTube channel. and they have been a request to us to increase the frequency from once in a week to twice in a week we are working on the feasibility and the logistics for the same welcome dr uh, vinita panigri from uh, jamshedpur jharkhand for the online pg class thank you sir and uh, today the class will be coordinated by dr joshna agarwal <laughs> dr joshna agarwal uh, introduces the speaker Uh, we have got amongst us Dr. Venkat Giri. Dr. Giri, a few words from your side. Now you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Navin. Good evening, all. Uh, Navin, that it is so popular not only in India in other sides. So when we had the SARC meetings, I uh, heard that there are some in my regular group. I used to send that they used to show to their peers also, even outside India. And maybe if uh, good that uh, in coming times uh, this may be and uh, uh, in the SARC countries also because they are also demanding for this type of this thing. We had that meeting, so it will become not only our uh, national but uh, international webinar soon that. Uh, in our next meeting maybe we will decide that with this uh, uh, the popularity is more and even other also the it is uh, free access to everybody people can see in uh, uh, isa uh, youtube channel uh, all the best and uh, pgs uh, and uh, thank you madam for uh, sparing your time for uh, taking this class and uh, nishant uh, for regularly coordinating uh, for this program thank you over to you joshna okay good evening sir good evening everyone <clears throat> so our speaker for today is dr vinita panigrahi senior consultant and head emergency services madam is a tata main hospital jamshedpur she has 16 years of post pg teaching experience with special interest in critical care and trauma madam is a dnb teacher for super specialty course dnb critical care medicine and nb formative assessment test examiner for anesthesiology and she is also a teacher and examiner of idccm and iccn courses madam has earned the vg apakuti gold medal for dnb anesthesia and serves young investigators award she has various uh, national and international publications and has done several presentations it is an honor to hear you madam please uh, welcome to the event uh, thank you dr joshna and uh... i am extremely grateful for the isa national headquarters for giving me this honor to take a class for the pg students uh like uh, uh dr malhotra said this is uh, really a very uh, good initiative and uh, i hope i do justice uh, to the opportunity that is given to me so good evening once again and uh, welcome uh, good evening to all my seniors the pg students and faculty uh, so today we have got a lot of time uh, we will make it an interactive class uh, trauma is a huge subject as we all know uh, so what we will be doing today is we will be highlighting on the principles of uh, initial assessment and management as happens in an emergency department 
so the anesthesia residents uh, most of the time handle trauma when the patient comes inside the operating room so by that time the uh, primary assessment the secondary assessment all are usually done so the uh, interaction with the trauma patient as the patient lands in the entry point of the hospital uh, usually is a little lacking with the anesthesia residents and the training uh, barring those who are a part of the trauma team and who are uh, regularly posted in the anesthesia Uh, in the ED emergency department, where their uh, exposure is good and they have got the uh, experience of handling. So, uh, keeping that in mind, I have tried to make this uh, uh, presentation very simple. Uh, I will be touching upon the key points because trauma, as every all of us know, is extremely vast and it will take uh, uh, many weeks to complete everything of trauma. So, I will be touching upon only the main point and i have derived all these uh, points from the atls guidelines of the american uh, surgical association so uh, i will give an overview pg students please feel free to stop me anytime uh, if you have any queries if you want to contribute uh, any uh, point or you disagree with any point you need for the clarification please feel free to stop me and we can have a meaningful discussion Uh, at the end of the uh, in between the um, presentation i may stop and i may ask a few question just to see whether you have followed up the previous uh, 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 build up to the uh, topic or not so if that is okay we will go ahead so today we will only give a overview of the systematic approach to the trauma management in an emergency department this is to sensitize the anesthesia residents of uh, who are mostly uh, having trauma scenarios in the uh, or so uh, let me give you a scenario so the emergency department gets a call that there has been a road traffic accident in the center of the city and people are grievously hurt so two people are grievously hurt the ambulance has been dispatched with paramedics uh this is as much of the information that we have so once we get an information like this there are a certain things that needs to be done the paramedic that is dispatched has a role in the pre hospital scenario and then the trauma team that is waiting to receive the patient has a role to uh, um, manage and handle the patient subsequently so the systematic approach is like this you make a preparation then there is a triage we have a primary survey the primary survey always goes uh, follows the pattern a b c d e now this may be confusing if we uh, think of the acls uh, the bls sequence which is uh, uh, not uh, uh, it is c a b so remember a b c d e is always done when a patient has a pulse and when a patient is serious and he needs to be immediately handled so in the trauma also we will be doing that so along the primary survey a b c d e we do immediate resuscitation of the patient and handle the life threatening injuries first after the primary survey there is something called adjunct to primary survey and resuscitation at that time your hospital can choose whether to admit this patient or shift this patient to a proper trauma center supposing we are admitting this patient then we go for the secondary survey secondary survey is always a head to toe evaluation along with specific and focused history then there are some adjuncts to secondary survey after that we continue with the post resuscitation monitoring and continuous re evaluation of the patient this patient can deteriorate at any time so a continuous reevaluation is very important and then of course a definitive care has to be taken because we have to handle the uh, trauma so in the pre hospital phase the emphasis is given to airway management airway maintenance so the uh, team that is dispatched will have to take care of the airway uh, maintenance so along with airway maintenance whenever we talk of a polytrauma we always think of a cervical 
spine immobilization. In short, we call it C spine immobilization. So the paramedics that go, they are uh, trained to handle it. So they immediately they will put a neck collar. They may they, they may put the oxygen um, uh, mask. And depending on the type of the patient consciousness, they may put an oropharyngeal airway or or an nasopharyngeal airway. Usually, definitive airway manage uh, definitive airway is not advised in the pre-hospital phase. Then, control of external bleeding and shock. If there is a visible bleeding, that needs to be packed or you give an external pressure. Immobilize the patient always on a spine board with the cervical collar. Then, immediate transfer to the closest appropriate facility. So, in a pre-hospital phase, starting an IV line, giving an IV push. Usually should be avoided. The idea is to scoop and run, and do the uh, minimum that is needed to sustain the life. Like pay attention to the airway, and if there is a torrential bleeding or an external bleeding that we see, just put a packet and control it. So the goal again is to minimize the scene time. So as less time is spent on uh, spent on the scene, the better it is. So immediate. Uh, switching of the patient. So this is a, a table which is not very much clear, but it is available on the uh, net. So uh, students can go through this. This is actually very simple. That uh, shows us the field rising scene and how stepwise we will have to do. But in a nutshell, as I said, do not spend much time there and bring the patient to the hospital as soon as possible. So in the hospital phase, the preparation involves that you keep your resuscitation area free and ready. The airway equipment should be kept in readiness. All anesthesia uh, DN, uh, residents know what is an airway equipment, what is an airway trolley, and what all should be kept ready. But here uh, in trauma, we have to pay more attention on the warm crystalline solutions. This becomes uh, the crux of circulation management in a emergency department. So always remember to warm up the crystalloid solution that you are planning to uh, infuse. Backup manpower. Trauma could be very, very manpower intensive. So we have to have our backup team ready. The trauma, patient, the trauma team should be ready, but at the, uh, as a backup, the OT team, the surgical team, the orthopedic team, they have to be, uh, they have to be kept in standby. Transfer agreement with a verified trauma center. Usually all hospitals have got some uh, official, unofficial agreement with some uh, uh, higher center where uh, in cases of emergencies, the patients can be immediately shifted. So triaging is the most important thing that is done in an emergency. It is basically the sorting of patients based on the resources required for the treatment. Now, whenever we talk of triaging, the triaging could be different for different hospitals. So it depends on what is your uh, resource, uh, uh, how much is your capability to handle patients, how much uh, resources you have and how serious patients you are capable of handling. So depending that, uh, my triaging in my hospital could be different from uh, triaging in another hospital. So whenever we talk of triaging, we always keep in mind what is the capability and the resources present with us? So whenever we do a triaging, always take into account the A, B, C first, airway, breathing, circulation. Because these are the three things that could be immediately life-threatening. So whenever we talk of triaging, we always uh, 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 focus on the life-threatening events. So that has to be handled first. Then next will come the severity of injury. The more severe patients have to be handled first. Ability to survive, those who are salvageable, they have to be uh, uh, given more attention and available resources. So this triaging concept will change a little bit when we are talking of a scenario of uh, disaster or mass casualty, which I will be talking of in our uh, later slide. So uh, anybody who has worked in an emergency knows multiple casualties and mass casualties. So there's a slight difference here. Multiple casualties means the number of the patients and severity of injuries do not exceed capability of the facility, which means what? Supposing my department is capable of handling 20 patients at a time and I get 15, then that comes as a multiple casualty. But supposing I get 150 patients 
then that becomes a mass casualty because then it overwhelms my capability to handle them so whenever we are talking of multiple casualties patients with life threatening injuries and polytrauma are treated for why because we still have the uh, buffer and uh, the resources to handle patients so the patients who are at the risk of dying they have to be handled first just the opposite is mass casualty where you have to first handle the salvageable patient those who are in a life threatening condition will have to be uh, either ignored or you can keep them as late uh, as a later in priority list because you have a situation which has overwhelmed your capability so salvage those whom you can salvage so these are the two different rising situation we are facing so let us uh, say there is a scenario of a 65 year old man who has arrived in the ambulance our paramedics have gone and they have brought him he is incoherent he is restless he can speak only one word at a time and at the same time he is trying to pull away his clothes so if we see a patient who has come to us like this immediately a few points should immediately come in our mind so this is where we have to start organizing our thought process so whenever we see a patient who is not in cardiac arrest but he is in a restless and unstable condition train your mind to think of a b c airway breathing circulation in that order why not b a c because airway has got more propensity to kill first followed by breathing and circulation so train the mind to think of a b c whenever you see a unstable patient or a patient who is likely to become unstable so so here comes our primary survey with simultaneous resuscitation so first we will do an airway maintenance with restriction of a cervical spine so remember in a trauma whenever we say airway we always say airway with c spine immobilization so there are certain terminologies which are applicable to the atls uh, step so we have to remember those terminologies so that we apply it on the trauma scenario in the ot whenever we think of airway we are not thinking of cervical spine immobilization for all patients only for select patients but in a trauma always presume that there is a cervical spine injury unless otherwise proven so as a maintenance and c spine immobilization followed by breathing and ventilation so whenever we say breathing we always say breathing and ventilation now all uh, the anesthesia residents pg students know the difference between breathing and ventilation i will pause for 2 to 3 seconds here if you want to write down the difference in the chat box please go ahead and do so one sentence only what is the difference between breathing and ventilation uh, dr joshna is the chat box alive yes ma'am the chat box is alive okay all the, the participants are uh, motivated to please respond to the question uh, joshna take over from here yes everybody please write your answers the one one sentence answer yes the difference between breathing and ventilation because we will be uh, dwelling on this difference later on when we come to the actual management so moving ahead in the primary survey after breathing ventilation we come to circulation and hemorrhage control followed by disability disability basically is an assessment of the neurological status then comes exposure or environment control when we speak of exposure we are actually uh, what i mean is the patient <clears throat> should be fully exposed and this has to be done without fail in all cases i can give you umpteen examples from uh, my own experience in trauma where we have missed findings just because we did not remove the clothes and most of the time you will see people will be hesitant because usually the trauma area is chaotic there is not uh, privacy is not very much there and people will be a little shy or hesitant to remove clothes but in this case please do not feel shy you have to keep your curtains ready 
and the uh, minute the patient comes and as soon as you shift the patient to your trolley somebody should be ready with the scissors and just go on cutting the cloth because if you miss an injury that could be very very uh, devastating for the patient later on so exposure is extremely important but in some cases where the air condition is on or if it is winter or in cold places we may uh, make this process a little quick so that immediately after exposure and the uh, examination the patient can be again put back on uh, with warm blanket or uh, warm up if they are present environment control again you have to see check what is the environment here if the whether the patient is dipped in any uh, toxic material or not so these things come under the exposure and environment control and we have, we have to keep the excuse me we have got some okay. answers ma'am for breathing ventilation uh, okay okay right uh, so we can go ahead uh, and environment control it is very important to maintain the temperature of your trauma suit uh, so that the patient do not go into hypothermia hypothermia is a very important uh, uh, point here we will be dwelling on the hypothermia later on so in a primary survey we always do a quick assessment so how do you do a quick assessment it's a 10 second assessment ask the patient his or her name and describe the incident is the person able to describe this incident now supposing we go back to our patient this is a 65 year old man he is incoherent speaking only one word at a time so is he able to describe the incident the answer is no if you ask this patient his name in all probability he will not be able to do so so if you get a proper response then you can say that there is no major airway compromise if a patient is speaking clearly then the breathing is not compromised and if the patient is alert the level of consciousness is not compromised so in our patient probably the airway is compromised because he is not able to speak beyond one word and the breathing definitely is compromised because he is restless and he is are uh, not able to speak properly so in this cases always also take a, uh, a quick assessment uh, to look for a foreign body or a, whether there is a fracture mandible fracture of the facial bones or a laryngeal fracture so recognition of airway compromise you can uh, uh, recognize this either by um, talking to the patient or you have your further uh, this thing uh, examination to do recognize potential for progressive airway loss this is important because how do you do this you have to keep on reassessing the patient sometimes the patient can come in a little conscious state and subsequently he can become uh, disoriented up and down then unconscious so uh, if you are quickly continuously reassessing then you immediately recognize whether there was a potential for airway loss or not frequent evaluation and surgical airway uh, if intubation is not possible we have to be prepared for all of it now coming to breathing and ventilation so uh, what was the answer for that yes, question sir. we have got few answers um, ventilation is gas exchange breathing is spontaneous ventilation is assisted or controlled ventilation is provided externally whereas breathing is by the patient breathing is inspiration expiration ventilation is gas exchange okay so most of them have given the correct answer breathing yeah. basically is a mechanical thing and ventilation is a gas exchange so to have sometimes we use them synonymously uh, we can exchange uh, uh, use both the words interchangeably and if you want to be more specific <coughs> like in your exam and all you can use them differently so uh, to have a proper ventilation you need a functioning lung you need a functioning chest wall and you also need a functioning diaphragm now whether these things are okay or not how do you see in this patient 65 year old patient who has come to you so in that case expose the neck and look for jugular venous distension position of the trachea and chest wall excursion 
So in this scenario, I have not given you any information about the jugular vein or the position of the trachea. So just for excursion, you will get some idea this patient is restless and is not able to speak properly. So probably the chest wall excursion is not good. So immediately you know that the breathing is compromised. To check the circulation, you have to circulate the issues basically at blood volume, the cardiac output, and whether there is an ongoing bleeding or not. <coughs> if you have, if you uh, look at the patient and inspect, you will be able to get a good idea whether the circulation has been hampered or not. Clinically, we can have a fairly good idea about the volume and the cardiac output by the level of consciousness of this patient, by the skin perfusion, and also by checking the pulse. So level of consciousness, if this patient is altered consciousness, results when there is a cerebral perfusion abnormality or the cerebral perfusion is low because of hypovolemia resulting from excessive bleeding. So the patient will always be an altered sensorium or upturned. Likewise, the skin will be cold and clammy to touch. In extreme cases, you may have cyanosis uh, in the finger tip. And then a patient's cardiac output is actually going down and the skin perfusion is, has uh, suffered. The patient looks a little different. We call it ashen gray. If you have seen these patients, you will remember how that look is. So uh, once you see a patient, you will always remember all your life what an ashen gray facial uh, uh, color is. Now, check the pulse. The pulse will be a rapid, steady pulse, which is a sign of hypovolemia. If you have to check the regularity, irregularity, in most cases, you may not be able to appreciate it from the radial pulse. <coughs> so you will have to go for a central pulse check. Bleeding is very easy to identify if it is external bleeding. But supposing the bleeding is concealed or internal, you have to use your clinical acumen very carefully. And the only way to identify is keep, uh, keep reassessing the patient so that you do not miss. Whenever you see a bleeding, the first thing we do is always put a manual pressure. When, we, when I'm saying manual pressure, take some gauze steel and actually press it on the site of the bleeding and keep it pressed for a long, long time. So that is used for a rapid external blood loss. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes this may not work, so in, we can uh, go to tunique. Tunique is used when there is a massive exsanguination from the uh, extremity. How much pressure is to be used in a tunique? We will be coming to that subsequently. So external bleeding is easy, but internal bleeding is difficult to uh, assess. So we have to know which are the areas of internal bleeding. So mostly they can happen in chest, abdomen, retroperitoneum, pelvis, long bones. So always know that if your patient is still having hypotension despite giving an initial fluid bolus, then think of concealed or internal bleeding. You will get a fairly good idea if you have exposed and examined the body of the patient properly because you may have confusion and marks of abrasion, and that will give you an idea of where the bleeding might have happened. For example, if you get a mark of abrasion in the flank, you can very well think that there could be an intraperitoneal hemorrhage, the damage to solid organs like your liver and spleen, depending on where you have got the marking. If you have got the markings in the back, then there's a very good chance that this patient might be having a retroperitoneal bleed. And retroperitoneal bleed are very uh, dangerous because you cannot pick them up in your normal fast examination. So if you have to look at bleeding, you do a general examination properly, do a chest x-ray, do a pelvic x-ray. They will tell you whether there is fracture or not. In chest x-ray, you will be able to pick up a massive hemothorax. Pelvic x-ray, you do not uh, identify the bleeding, but depending on the type of fracture you get, you will have a very good idea of how much is the bleeding. Then focus assessment, fast examination, and a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. Sometimes you do it when you suspect there is an intra-abdominal bleeding. So once you have a bleeding, the first thing you do is start 
two large both peripheral venous lines, and then you give a fluid bolus. Remember, this fluid has to be warm, warm to body temperature. Then you do a baseline blood sampling for baseline hematological studies, and always send the grouping cross matching to the blood bank as soon as that is feasible. Along with that, do a blood gas or blood test to assess the presence and degree of shock. Uh, <clears throat> in institutions where a blood gas is not available, you can send the uh, sample to the lab uh, to the lab and get a lactate value. Lactate also can give you a very good idea about the uh, degree and extent of acidosis. It it acts as a surrogate marker. It may not be very accurate all the time, but by and large, it can guide you. Uh, not only to prognosticate and assess the severity, but also to go on with your resuscitation. And if your peripheral sites are not active, then ATLA suggests that you go for intraosseous or central venous site. You may even go for venous cut down. Intraosseous is a little uh, <clears throat> less popular in our country. Not many institutions use the intraosseous, but if your institution is using, then you can go for it uh, right away without. Wasting time in looking for uh, other venous access. By the time a patient comes to us to the hospital, uh, studies have shown that these patients already have uh, reached a stage of trauma in this coagulopathy. If we are talking of a polytrauma, so the recommendation is in the field. If your paramedics have gone. They should give one bolus dose of tranexamic acid, that is one gram. And once the patient comes to the hospital, a second dose or a follow-up dose has to be given. Now, tranexamic acid within three hours of injury <coughs> has been shown to uh, favorably affect the survival profile of the patient. So we have done A, B, C. Now come to the D. <coughs> In B, we basically do a neurological evaluation. This is where you do your GCS. Uh, usually, the practice. I am deviating a little from the slide. Uh, normally, when we see a patient, uh, the first thing that we do is give a uh, big press on the sternum and check the GCS. But when we are handling a polytrauma, a patient who is severely seriously injured, <clears throat> again. Train your mind to go for A first, then B, then C, then D. A GCS in the first attempt is not going to help you. What is going to help you is first the error management. So without losing any time on examinations which are not top in the priority, we should go for the systematic approach. So I will be repeating this time and again. A, B, C. That is how we go. After you do C, come to D. So this is where you check your GCS. When we are doing a GCS, also see the pupillary size and reaction. This is to look for lateralizing sign in case there is a head injury. Once you get a lateralizing sign, the chances are very high that this patient has had a bleeding, intracranial bleed. <clears throat> so likewise, you can inform the neurosurgeon and keep the other things ready. Here we also do. Uh, assessment of the spinal cord injury if it is present. I will pause a little here. I want to ask our uh, students, how do you do a spinal cord injury assessment uh, quickly on the bedside? <clears throat> students, please write your answer. Write your answer in the chat box. Just write whether you will go for a sensory examination or a motor examination. Babinski. Babinski. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> no, usually if there is a spinal cord injury, first see whether the patient is able to move or lean or not. If the, whether there is a paraplegia or there is a quadriplegia. Babinski comes much later when we do the detailed neurological examination that will come in the secondary assessment. But in the primary assessment, remember primary means quick, immediate, and this primary will help you in doing some intervention that will save life. 
So here we just want to know whether the spinal cord has been affected or not. So for that, just see whether the patient is able to move his limbs or not. Whether there is a paraplegia or there is a quadriparesis or there is a hemiparesis. That much only we will have to do now. And subsequent detailed examination we will do later on, which I will be telling you. <coughs> now, exposure, like I said, completely undressed, cover the patient, warm IV fluids, and hypothermia is very lethal, so always prevent hypothermia. <coughs> so, our patient again, if you have to see the A, B, C, which is uh, compromised here, you can write down your answer in the chat box. Is it A, is it B, is it C, or is it all of them? Everybody is encouraged to please make it an interactive session. Please write your answers, whatever yes. you feel. Please write your answers so that you will also know where you have not understood so that I can clarify. Okay. All. Ma'am, they have all. Been okay. The all is correct. Because this patient is not able to speak properly, he is speaking one word at a time. So it means breathing definitely is hampered. He is restless, trying to pull his clothes. This shows a sign of cerebral hypoperfusion. So definitely the circulation has been affected. And airway most probably is affected because although he is able to make some, uh, he is able to vocalize something, but he is not doing it properly. So once your breathing is affected, you have to take care of the airway also because otherwise you will not be able to manage. So the answer is correct. It is all. <clears throat> so this patient was oxygenated and given a bag mask ventilation. The SpO2, which was initially 74% with 10 liters of oxygen, and then he was intubated and put on IPTV through a brain circuit. Now after the IPTV, his SpO2 initially went up to 79% then dipped to 66%. What is the next step? <clears throat> you can have this scenario in the OT also. So just think. Uh, I will give you two, two or three seconds. Quickly, if you can write down. Quickly, write your answers. Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax. Okay. Okay, the thought is correct, pneumothorax, but what is the next step? So the next step is primary and secondary surveys are repeated frequently to identify any change in the patient status. So in our patient, we did an ABC assessment. Then we, <clears throat> we thought that uh, the patient needed ABC uh, support. So we have intubated, we have regulated this patient, manual IPTV. But after manual IPTV, the uh, parameters are going down. So in that case, do not go for further, again go back to A, B, C. So once the A, B, C are stabilized, only then you go for your subsequent assessment. So in this patient, even after intubation, the A, B, C is still not settled because the SPO2 is going down. So we have to again go back. You check whether the airway is in right, uh, the tube is in right place or not, whether the tube is patent or not, whether bilateral air entry is there or not, and whether you are able to get a good chest rise. Now, after that, you have to do the adjunct with primary assessment. <clears throat> so what are the adjuncts to primary survey? That is the continuous ECG monitoring and do your pulse oximetry, CO2 monitoring, because we have already intubated this patient, we want to do an ECCO2 monitoring here. Assess the ventilation. How do you assess this ventilation? <clears throat> right now, the patient is on the vein circuit in your hand, which means you don't have the ventilatory parameters, but you can still have a good assessment. The feel of the bag, the improvement of his uh, parameters on, this, uh, on the monitor, and clinically whether he's improving or not. If you connect this patient to the ventilator, of course, you will get all the parameters, your tidal volume, uh, airway pressures, your, uh, um, everything else you will get. Here we do an ABG analysis and check for the lactate. Then go for indwelling catheter because we want a urine output and also we want to assess whether hematuria is present or not. If hematuria is present, what do you think? <clears throat> this patient also could be having a pelvic injury. 
Then you have a gastric catheter to decompress the stomach, then assess for evidence of any GI bleed is there or not. Then do the X-ray. <coughs> X-ray of the chest and pelvis, then of course you're fast. So our patient has not improved with ABC and somebody correctly said that it could be a pneumothorax. So we have to do a fast here because X-ray might take time to go for a fast. After checking your tube placement and tube positioning and the patency. So go for fast and in the fast you will see whether the pneumothorax is present or not. Now I said that we are uh, we want to check for the ABG. What are uh, what exactly are we going to see in the ABG? pH, PaO2. Okay. Yeah, the answer is correct. We are looking for acidosis. <clears throat> If acidosis, then what is the severity of acidosis? pH, P, uh, PCO2, by car. Then later on, we will come to PaO2 and other parameters. So acidosis, looking for acidosis is very important because trauma uh, can cause hypothermia. Hypothermia can cause acidosis, coagulopathy. So if you detect acidosis early, you can treat it. So the patient does not go into the vicious cycle because acidosis will initiate a vicious cycle and the patient will go spiraling down. So here we need an ABG and we also need a lactate. Lactate also will help us to check whether our resuscitation is good or not and whether lactate clearing is happening. So why do we put a urinary catheter? See, initially this is a patient. We have not have a central line. We do not have any invasive uh, hemodynamic monitoring. So at this stage, the urine output is the best hemodynamic monitor we have. So we have to put the urinary catheter and then examine the urine specimen. Uh, if you are suspecting a urethral injury, how do you know there could be an urethral injury? You may have a blood at the tip of the urethral meters. You can have a confusion around the perineal area. So in those cases, you can uh, you will have to see uh, suspect urethral injury. In those cases, do not go for normal. Uh, urethral catheterization, you have to go for either a suprapubic or other thing. <coughs> Retrograde urethrogram should be done if suspected urethral injury is present. So this is all about the primary survey. So we have done the primary survey, A, B, C, D, E. Then we have seen the adjuncts to the primary survey, which are the immediate monitoring and the immediate imaging. So pay attention, we have not mentioned CT scan here. So CT scan is not part of this. The adjunct to primary survey, CT scan comes later. Huh? So X-ray of chest and pelvis are the primary adjunct. So if you have an X-ray machine nearby, first order for chest and pelvis for all polytrauma. Because these are the two X-rays that will tell you whether life threatening injuries are present or not. X-ray will tell you about the pneumothorax, which uh, some of you have rightly pointed out. And it can also tell us about massive pneumothorax. And pelvis uh, x-ray naturally will tell us about pelvic fracture and pelvic fractures are injuries which cause massive, massive blood loss, which you cannot see externally. So now we come to the secondary survey. Secondary survey is a head-to-toe evaluation. So this head-to-toe evaluation also proceeds in a particular sequence. So apart from that, you take a complete history, you do a full physical examination, and keep on reassessing the vital signs. And we begin the secondary survey only after the primary survey is complete and the patient's vitals are improving. If your patient's vital are not improving, go back to A, B, C, D, E. Do not go for secondary survey because that is not important now. What is important is to save the patient and attend to life-threatening uh, events. So again, go back to A, B, C. So this is what we always remember in trauma. What to do next? That should be very clear in mind. If A, B, C, D, E is not improving, do not go for secondary survey. Keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Because if you go to secondary survey, you are not paying attention to something that could kill the patient. <clears throat> so when we are talking of a history, basically it is an ample history. Uh, all of you must be knowing this. Ample means you... Uh, 
check for allergies medications currently used by the patient so when we are talking of medications we are not interested in atorvastatin or lesartan we are interested in antiplatelets and anticoagulants so if the patient is on antiplatelets or anticoagulants you should know what is the drug that has been used so that you can counter the effect so that bleeding could be minimized then you ask for past illnesses and whether pregnancy is there in our country we are a little shy to think of pregnancy in unmarried women who come in the reproductive age group but the atls uh, guideline is very clear for on this so any woman in the reproductive age group if the patient has come with trauma think of pregnancy also because if you miss a pregnancy you will be missing a lot and that will ultimately adversely affect the outcome then think of the last meal as anesthetics we all always as a habit ask about the last meal so this also comes in the ample history so this should not be missed then ask about the events or environment related to the injury how the injury happened because this is very important the type of injury there are certain injuries which are classified as high risk or dangerous injuries so once you elicit that history your uh, intervention and management and approach changes drastically so if it is a blunt trauma always ask whether the seat belt was in use whether the steering wheel of the car or the vehicle has been deformed because it tells you about the uh, magnitude of the impact it has had on the body whether the airbags have been activated whether it was a direct impact a head on collision whether there was damage to the automobile if the car is majorly deformed always assume that the patient is seriously injured and uh, whether the patient uh, what was the patient's position in the vehicle was he the driver was he the co passenger was he in the rear seat and whether he was ejected from the vehicle so these are the important histories in any trauma these histories should always come in your assessment sheet if it is a penetrating trauma always uh, note which is the region that has been injured what are the organs in the part of the penetrating object this should be in your mind you need not write it down if it is a, a stab injury to the right hypochondrium then you know which are the organs that could have been affected then the velocity of the missile whether it was a close range uh, gunshot it was a long shot gunshot so these things also help you in assessing the type of the severity of the injury so in the secondary survey like i said when you do a head to toe examination it follows a particular sequence the examination always starts with the head in head you see whether the scalp is uh, uh, intact or not whether there are any palpable or uh, uh, physically you can see any fracture whether there is a vitreous fracture then maxillofacial structure then come to the cervical spine and neck then chest after that go to the abdomen pelvis perineum rectum vagina these things should never never be missed if you keep the clothes on you are 100% sure to miss them so expose the patient and quickly do this examination then check the musculoskeletal system and the nervous system if a patient has come with a thermal injury or burn injury then you check the circumstances of the burn injury was it an inhalation was it a flame burn was it a a scald injury or chemical burn whether the patient had wet clothes on or whether there was alcohol ingestion so this is a table that shows uh, the possible injuries that you derive from the mechanism of injury so at leisure you can go through this table it is available online so this will give you a very good idea of what are the things you are dealing with a good practice would be if you take a print out of this page and then keep it in your person so that you can readily refer to it so this i have already said examine the scalp for laceration contusion then examine the eye visual acuity how do you know the visual acuity just shake your hand in front of the patient and see ask him whether he is able to see you if he is able to see you probably his vision is intact see the look for the pupillary size the hemorrhages what is the conjunctiva the fundus this will come later on in a penit whether the there has been any penetrating injury or not 
if the patient on contact lens, if the patient is having contact lens, you should immediately remove it. Because in the process of resuscitation, or if the patient deteriorates, edema will develop and that will damage the cornea. And dislocation of lens, ocular entrapment, all that we have to note down. In the face, palpate all the bony structures, the major bones of the face should always be palpated. So once you palpate, you will know whether the occlusion is there or not, whether any uh, crepitus or movement of the bones are there or not. Intraoral examination, if the patient is for obeying command, you can open his mouth or you can just do it. If the patient is unconscious into that, you can do the intraoral examination. Assessment of the soft tissues. Uh, so uh, to minimize further damage, what you do is just elevate the head end of the patient. Uh, if any patient who has got a mid-face uh, mid injury, uh, it could be a uh, fracture of the cribriform plate, it could be fracture maxilla, or plain and simple, it could be a fracture of base of the skull. How do you know a fracture of base of skull is there if you have not done a CT scan? Usually, you will have bleeding from the ear and the nose, or there could be CSF rhinorrhea. If any of this happens, then always think that it is a, it could be a fracture base of skull. So, in those cases, never put a nasogastric tube. You will always have to go for an orogastric tube. And also remember, never put a nasopharyngeal airway in these patients. So this is something which, which will come. You have to develop it as a reflex. So to be on the safe side, in a head injury patient, avoid putting a nasogastric tube. Always put an orogastric tube till you have the CT scan. And once the CT scan has ruled out any fracture in the base of the skull or in the middle of the face, the uh, uh, bones of the nose and maxilla, then you can remove the oropharynx and replace it with the nasopharynx. So these are certain uh, uh, things that you have to remember and always practice in the emergency. Once the patient comes to the OT, the patient always comes with the full, uh, usually a full set of uh, investigation, then you know for sure what are the injuries. So in that case, you can go for a nasogastric. But if you, as a part of the trauma team, have Receive the patient in the emergency, always go for a orogast. Coming to the cervical spine and neck examination. So, these spine should be restricted. In the neck, what are you seeing? In on inspection, you see for any visible injuries or swelling. Palpate for tenderness, tracheal position, subcutaneous repetitors. It is very important. If there is a disruption of the airway, the uh, larynx, the trachea and your bronchi, then you will have air leaking into the soft tissue. So from a distance, it looks uh, uh, swollen, but if you put your hand here, you will have small crepitus, bubbles cracking. You will have this feeling. Once you have this feeling, you will always remember it. So look for that. Laryngeal fracture. I have never seen a laryngeal fracture in my life, but uh, as per the textbooks, a laryngeal fracture is very easy to palpate and diagnose. Then palpate for the carotid artery. You have to do an auscultation of the neck, check for GUI. Then, most important, if your patient has come with a helmet, there is a method of removing the helmet. So this always has to take place as per the uh, guided uh, uh, prescription laid down. So if you see the picture, see the picture A first, then B, then C, then D. So in the A, somebody has given a manual inline stabilization. So you need two people to remove helmet in a head injury patient who has come with unconscious or even if he is conscious, you should always follow this process. So somebody gives a manual inline stabilization looking at the face of the patient, means he's standing near the torso. Somebody is standing at the head end. So the person who is standing at the head end first gives a flexion of the uh, helmet. You first bend it forward, then in the next step, you put it backward, then gradually remove it. So all the while, the head and the neck have to be kept in the neutral position. A very, very big mistake that most of us do, and usually this damage happens in the pre-hospital scenario. A bystander who has picked up will just remove the helmet just like that. So if the patient had a cervical injury, this movement is very bad. 
and it it has already caused the cervical cord damage so our job is to prevent secondary images uh, secondary damages so we have to follow this process to remove the helmet so this is something which all the and uh, PG students can try it. All of you must be having mannequin in your institution. Put a helmet to the mannequin and try removing the helmet, and you will know this process properly. Next, come to the chest. In the inspection, look for open pneumothorax. What is an open pneumothorax? Open pneumothorax means you you have a wound which is there in the chest wall, and you can see it. Plus, you will have features of a pneumothorax. Then look for flail segment. What is a flail segment? It is a segment of the chest wall that moves opposite to the normal breathing. So in a normal breathing, the chest would expand. If you have a flail segment, the segment goes down when the patient is breathing. So it is kind of a paradoxical breathing. So why this flail happens? This flail segment happens if you have a fracture of two or more ribs, and the ribs have broken at two places. So in that case, you have a flail segment. So a flail segment is a very big impediment to breathing. So once you have a flail segment, your B is compromised. So you have to go for intubation and assisted breathing. Then C for contusions or hematoma. Palpate the chest cage. Always go and hold the chest cage properly and try to give a little pressure. So if you have a chest, uh, uh, sorry, if you have a rib fracture, you will get a crepitus and you will feel it with your hands. So always palpate the whole of this, and that way you can pick up fracture ribs. Then look for the clavicles, the ribs, and the sternum. So in percussion, hyperresonance. Hyperresonance means what? Can anybody answer? If you get hyperresonance on percussion, what will you think? Please write your answers in the chat box. If you get hyper resonance on percussion of the chest, what would you think in a trauma scenario? Just one word answer. Pneumothorax. So hyper resonance always means more air. Okay. So if you are getting hyper resonance, immediately think of pneumothorax. Then auscultate. If you are looking for pneumothorax. Occulted high up in the anterior chest wall, and if you are thinking of hemothorax, always occulted the posterior lower segment, the basal segment. So these are the golden rules you have to remember. Then you are also occulting the heart. If the heart sound appears distant, it means it could be a uh, pericardial effusion or tamponade. Then you check the pulse pressure. All of you know pulse pressure is the difference between the Between what? Systolic and diastolic. So a decreased pulse pressure means it's a hypovolemia, and it also happens with cardiac tamponade. And then you go for the X-ray. In X-ray, if you have a widened mediastinum, think of aortic rupture. So the other examination, go to abdomen and pelvis again, just for ecchymosis on the iliac crest. If you get ecchymosis in iliac crest, it means you are thinking of pelvic fracture. The pubis, the labia, the scrotum, and pain on palpation. So these are the things you should look for. Then, if there is any unexplained hypotension, you are resuscitating, and yet the blood pressure is not coming up, then think of pelvic fracture. Then check the perineum, rectum, vagina, where you have to check for contusion, hematoma, or urethral bleeding. Sometimes you may have to do a rectal examination where you see whether the Rectal wall is intact or not, and whether there is blood there or not. Okay, and also check the sphincter tone. This will give you a very good idea of the spinal cord uh, involvement. Then, in a female, always do a vaginal examination to see whether there is uh, blood is present in the vaginal uh, vault or not. So, if you have an intra-abdominal bleeding, you can have blood in the vaginal vault, and whether there is vaginal laceration. If you are suspecting Or injury to the perineum. Always look for the general laceration. So that was your secondary survey. Now, like your primary survey, the secondary survey also comes with some adjuncts. So these are some specialized tests which we do after the secondary survey is done. So what are the specialized tests 
which you will order a little late. So these are extra examination of the spine and extremities. So remember, chest and pelvis X-ray comes in the primary assessment, and spine and extremity X-ray comes in the secondary assessment. Then you will order a CT scan of the head, chest, abdomen, spine. Contrast urography if you are suspecting an urethral injury. Contrast angiography wherever you think there is a vascular injury. And then you have specialized tests like trans, esophageal, ultrasound, bronchoscopy. These are relevant to the type of the injury that you have seen. So it is not done for all cases. It is done for very, very specialized cases where only specific injuries are suspected. So why is management of airway and ventilation important? Because preventable deaths occur if you fail to assess the airway. If you fail to recognize the need for airway intervention and if you are not able to establish an airway or if you have established an airway and it has been incorrectly placed and you don't know or the airway has been displaced. So having said this, these are things which I don't have to tell the anesthesia PG. Uh, this is something your bread and butter and we will just uh, graze through this uh, slide. So what is the definitive airway? You all know. And maintaining oxygenation, preventing hypercarbia is important, more so in a head injury patient. So regarding the airway management, <clears throat> there are different scenarios where different type of airway management, uh, airway involvement happens. So I will not go through everything. It is there on the table, but depending on the scenario you get, think how the airway could have been managed, uh, could have been impaired and what you will have to do. But this is something you have to know. How do you know that the airway is obstructed? The patient will be agitated. Why does a patient get agitated? Not everybody is in alcohol withdrawal. So whenever you have see an agitated patient, think of hypoxia first, think of hypoperfusion to the brain neck. That means uh, breathing, oxygenation, and circulation. Both are impaired. Therefore, the agitation is taking place. Plus, there are many other causes of agitation which you will uh, know later on as you go on assessing the patient. If a patient is upended, think of hypercardia. If the patient has cyanosis, think of hypoxia again because of inadequate oxygen. If there are abnormal breathing sounds, if a patient is making noisy breathing, then definitely your airway is affected. If the patient is abusive, don't take offense or don't hold the patient back. This is a hypoxic patient. Therefore, he is abusive and combative. So, look at the hypoxia. Now, how do you know whether there is inadequate ventilation? The rise and fall of the chest will be asymmetric. Why should it be asymmetric? One side of the chest obviously has got an injury and there is inadequate chest expansion or labored breathing. Then your ventilation has been affected. There is decrease or absent breath sound in one or both hemithorax, low oxygen saturation, and capnography also shows abnormal value. How do you predict difficult airway? I don't have to say this. Everybody knows this. Lemon assessment, again, all of you know. Malampati, all of you know. Uh, so these are certain clinical criteria we'll have to see. Again, we come to ABCD. Inability to maintain a patent airway. Inability to maintain adequate oxygenation, obtundate or combative patient, and obtundation indicating a head injury and low GC. So go for a definitive error. These are the indications, and this table is there in all books. So airway, uh, difficult airway algorithm. Now ATLS has got a very simple airway algorithm. This is very easy to follow, but it appears uh, it applies to the trauma patients. But in our OTS, we have got our own uh, airway algorithm. So follow whichever algorithm you are comfortable with. But if you are in the emergency department, this is a very simple algorithm that can be followed. What is this? Can anybody say? You can type it. Okay, type it, we will go forward. Surgical airway. 
don't spend much time in trying to intubate. If you have not done it uh, in two attempts, then go for a surgical labor. Needle cricot thyroidotomy is something which is very simple and it can be done by anybody. If you have tried it on an airway mannequin one, you can do it on a real patient. So all you need is a uh, needle uh, uh, and a syringe and uh, look for the cricothyroid member and immediately do a puncture. Surgical cricothyroidomy, again, it is uh, easy for us to do, but you need a little practice. After that, it can be done. So oxygenation is something we have to uh, uh, always monitor. Uh, always remember the difference, uh, the relation between PaO2 and SpO2. If your SpO2 is more than 95%, it is a reliable indicator that your oxygenation is good. Now coming to shock. We need to uh, recognize the presence of shock because identifying it is very important. Any injured person, if the patient has got tachycardia and is cold, then you have to think of shock. Now, shock in trauma could be non-hemorrhagic, could be hemorrhagic. Most important, you get hemorrhagic shock. Non-hemorrhagic shock, there are different types. You have to differentiate between them. There is a very easy table which you can follow, and it depends on the uh, simple physical examination. So, hemorrhagic shock happens when you lose a lot of blood. So, this is the table that gives you the different class of hemorrhage. So depending on the class of hemorrhage, you have to do your resuscitation. So blood transfusion, blood has to be arranged in a trauma patient. The aim is to restore the oxygen carrying capacity. Ideally, you should go for a full cross match. If not, then you can go for uncross match. But in that case, you have to document it. Documentation is very important. And while you are transfusing blood or IV fluid, prevent hypothermia, that is, that is most important. Massive blood transfusion, the definition, the indication, the complications, all the uh, anesthesia PG students know. I will not go into details of this. Okay, this is the question. You can give the answer later on. If you transfuse one whole blood, how much, how much hemoglobin is increased and uh, what happens when you transfuse one unit of pipe? So depending on the type of response you get, you have rapid responder, you have transient responder, and you have minimal responder. When you have a transient and minimum responder, how do you respond to that? You have to call a surgeon early to the bedside side of the patient, and they have to take a decision. Trauma always comes in a package. The package consists of hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy. All three are bad for the patient. So hypo, uh, acidosis and hypothermia we have seen. Now coagulopathy happens if there is a hypothermia. Coagulopathy happens if there is a lot of blood loss, conjunctive coagulopathy. Coagulopathy can also happen if you do massive transfusion. So in that cases, handling this and recognizing it is important. So tranexamic acid as the patient uh, approaches and take a history of newer anticoagulants. What was the type of drug that was given? Do specific lab examination and transfuse uh, specific blood product. Particular importance, thoracic trauma, always look for hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis. If there is a tension pneumothorax, which is very common in a thoracic uh, injury, the signs and symptoms are chest pain, tachypnea, tachycardia, air hunger, respiratory distress, once you see this, think of pneumothorax. And if the patient has hypotension, think of tension pneumothorax. Once you think of tension pneumothorax, just check the trachea and see that it is deviated. Look at the neck vein. These are the two things that will help you distinguish in tension pneumothorax from cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax from massive pneumothorax. So never, never forget these things. If you have a tension pneumothorax, immediately go for the needle decompression or finger thoracotomy. Finger thoracotomy, you might find a little difficult, but needle decompression is very easy. Go at the fifth intercostal space, slightly anterior to the mid axillary line, and put a needle uh, uh, over cath catheter over needle, and then remove the needle, and that will help in the decompression 
but this has to be followed by an icd listener because this alone will give you only a little space and a little time till you put the icd so tube thora question has to be done then you have open pneumothorax in massive uh, chest injury if the opening is more than two third of the uh, diameter it becomes a sucking wound so you have to immediately put a dressing and dressing means you put an occlusive dressing and seal three sides leave one side open always in an open pneumothorax so that it acts like a flutter valve massive pneumothorax you can recognize hypotension in the chest x ray you will see you will have dull percussion no uh, very uh, diminished breath sound and your neck vein will be collapsed so think of massive hemothorax go for a uh, go for a icd this i have already said the difference between tension hemothorax and massive hemothorax now cardiac tamponade is another dangerous thing how do you pick it up you see this muffled heart sound distended neck vein hypotension So small sign is there. Your fast examination will help you. If you are doing your fast on the bedside, go to the uh, sub uh, uh, zippered area, and then you will see a cardiac effusion and a cardiac tamponade. So do a pericardial synthesis, but pericardial synthesis is not the answer. You have to ultimately go for a thoracostomy or a sternotomy, but this has to be done by a qualified surgeon. Traumatic circulatory arrest. If you have a circulatory arrest. the algorithm of the circulatory arrest has to be followed okay this is the algorithm which you have but in this case always remember you have to give a cpr you have to give the resuscitation but at the same time you should always do a laparotomy or a sternotomy and you may have to give an internal cardiac massage unless you stop the area of the bleeding this patient will never revive so a traumatic circulatory arrest is a little different from a normal cardiac arrest in this case you have to go full uh, ahead and find out this cause so abdomen and pelvic trauma you may be seeing a lot of them in your practice early evaluation you is very important think of abdominal and pelvic trauma from the clinical signs and the presentation mechanisms are like all of you know blunt trauma deceleration injury penetration injury you have to do a physical examination Full examination of the abdomen. Just inspect the flank, scrotum, urethra. I have all uh, repeatedly told you this. Uh, everything, all these points, we have already discussed. So, what is the adjunct? Uh, you put a gastric tube. If there is bleeding, the blood comes out. Put a bladder. If there is bleeding, the blood comes out. Extra abdomen. Pass. Pass is very very important. Gives you bedside. Very important finding. But remember. Pass will not tell you if there is just a peritoneal bleeding. So if your patient is not having intraperitoneal bleed, but you have a suspicion it's an abdominal injury, hypotension is persisting. Think of retroperitoneal anatomy. So this is how you see between your spleen and the kidney or liver in the kidney, you will see the black uh, color, and that is the fluid. Pelvic structure. These are the different mechanisms of pelvic structure. most important in a pelvic fracture is an immobilization by a pelvic binder you can have commercially available binders but very easy just put a uh, bed sheet roll it and tightly fix it and then keep them in position by sponge folding process so that will act as a pelvic binder this helps before you try to move the patient or if you do want to do a log roll so stabilizing the pelvis is very important head injury in head injury always remember prevent a secondary brain injury whatever injury has been done is done do not allow a further injury to happen so classification all of you know this gcs all of you know you are practicing how is initial management done ct scan obviously is needed neurosurgical evaluation in moderate and severe take an ample history and do the Normal workup, primary, secondary assessment remains the same. In a head injury, sometimes you are uh, you speak of hyperventilation. This can come as a question in your examination also. Remember, prophylactic hyperventilation should not be done. 
do hyperventilation only as a life saving modality if there is impending sign of cooling manitol can be given as an urgent basis even before a ct scan is done if you are having a rapid deterioration of the gcs but manitol should not be given if there is hypotension in that case you can go for hypotonic saline barbiturate is always the last resort intractable icp not responding to surgical and medical management only in those cases thing anticonvulsants usually we give as a matter of practice this is to prevent a post traumatic seizure how much it helps that is again a matter of controversy but it has been a practice to give phenytoin in all cases of head injury in head injury you have to keep certain goals most important is blood sugar sodium temperature and prevent a uh, hypercarbia and prevent fever so when we speak of spinal cord trauma there are two uh, terms which we have to learn to differentiate one is a neurogenic shock and one is a spinal shock so neurogenic shock is when there is a loss of vasomotor bato- bato- tone uh, dr jotna please tell me then i have to stop okay ma'am ma'am how much time is more uh, i will take uh, five more minutes is it okay yes ma'am please please it's very interesting yeah so we need to differentiate between neurogenic shock and spinal shock so neurogenic shock is related always to the level of injury if you have an injury up to t6 up uh, from cervical down up to t6 then most of your sympathetic nerves have gone so you have a vasodilatation so that is neurogenic shock but spinal shock is a reflex wherever there is a spinal trauma the muscle will become flaccid because of the loss of reflex so these are the different spinal segment and the injury we were discussing how do you know whether a spinal injury is happening but sensory will come later first you always get the motor so if you have a spinal injury what happens the patient will not have pain it is good or bad it is bad because you that that effect will mask the presence of other injuries and you may miss a lot of injuries and if it is a thoracic injury always look for a paraplegia if it is a cervical injury you get a quadriplegia different types of spinal injury can happen so atlanta occipital dislocation uh fracture these are all uh, basically theoretical questions uh, in practice uh, in practice there may not be a lot of uh, distance between management and surgery so c1 fracture c2 fracture fracture and dislocation Similarly, thoracic spine fractures are a little uh, uh, less common because the thoracic spine is less mobile. But you can even have wedge compression, burst injury, stern fractures, and all that. So whether to do an imaging or not is guided by two algorithms. One is the decision tool. This is the Canadian C spine rule, and the other is the Nexus criteria. So depending on these tables, we decide whether we should go for a uh imaging of the neck or not and this is something every anesthesia resident should know if you do not know it is actually a crime this is called log rolling movement so always whenever a trauma patient is moved it has to be done as a log rolling movement for log rolling you need four people two people standing on one side on this picture number a you see one person is at the head end who is stabilizing the neck there are two people who are holding look at the way they are holding one has got the hand on the left uh, shoulder and on the left hip the other has crossed his hand this is important the two uh, uh, doctors or staff or helpers their hand should be crossed like this if you do not cross then again you are allowing a, a sliding movement in the pelvis so the hand should be crossed and on the word go the patient is tilted the fourth person standing the job of the fourth person is to immediately do a complete assessment of the spine look for spinal tenderness look for any injury and in the same go you can even examine your perineum and rectum but this has to be done real fast now after that is done you can again put the patient back and the back movement again also has to be coordinated if you want to practice there are youtube videos that show you how a log roll is done 
and every anesthesia resident should know how a log rolling to be done. Last, the muscular skeletal trauma. You have got massive uh, long bone fractures and uh, loss of muscles. So always think of massive hemorrhage, and, uh, crush injury. Uh, when we are talking of crush injury, we are actually thinking of muscle injury. If a muscle is injured, the kidneys are always at uh, risk. Acute renal failure, shock, metabolic acidosis, DIC. The urine will be amber color. Treat with IV hypofluid. Alkalize the urine. Osmotic diuresis can be done. So whenever we are thinking of limb injuries, always go for immobilization and tourniquet. Compartment syndrome is very very dangerous. This has to be done clinically. Always develops when there is a closed injury. In an open injury, you never have a compartment. And if you have a compartment, the patient will be complaining of pain which is out of proportion. There will be tense and sometimes the pulse will be absent. The treatment is urgent fasciotomy. It has to be done then and there on the bed. So, if you have to summarize, how do you treat a trauma patient? It is always a multidisciplinary team for the management. Systemic approach is always to be followed. Focus on the basics. The basics is A, B, C. If your A, B, C have not been taken care of, don't proceed for that. Come back to A, B, C again. And most important, always prevent a secondary damage. Secondary damage usually happen because of mishandling, wrong posturing, and wrong way of handling patients. So pay attention to the basics and prevent a secondary damage, and then you will be doing a lot of good. Thank you. Ma'am, there is one question in the chat box. Uh, what is the fourth leg in the lethal diamond? The fourth point which has been added in the lethal triad. Sorry, the fourth point in the lethal triad? Yes, uh, there's one question in the chat box that okay. there's the fourth leg which is added to the lethal triad, which makes it a lethal diamond. So they're asking okay. what is the fourth point? See, the uh, uh, lethal things are basically see your hypothermia, your acidosis, your coagulopathy, okay? Then uh, you have, that goes as a uh, uh, vicious cycle. What adds to the lethality? Lethality is, will be your uh, hypoperfusion, your low uh, hypotension, causing a secondary damage, your uh, uh, complications of massive blood transfusion, okay, coagulopathy of the trauma, and secondary damage that can happen because of it. These are all which will add to it. Diamond. If you know, you tell me what is a diamond, but uh, I am not aware of it. We have added this point hypocalcemia. Which... Hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia happens. In two conditions, you will get hypocalcemia. One is if you have a severe crush injury. Okay. So in that case, you will have a hypocalcemia. The second thing is when you are going for a massive blood transfusion. So in the massive blood transfusion protocol, you have to replace the calcium. Okay. So if you give, uh, say, uh, one or two units Paxil have been given, you have to replace the calcium. So these are the two scenarios where you have hypocalcemia, but the uh, treatment remains the same. If you are doing it for a massive uh, protocol, you know why it is happening. And if it is happening in a crush injury, then again, you know, you have to hydrate and you have to resuscitate. That is how it will help you. Yes. And one person is asking, should we follow A, B, C or C, A, B? This has already been discussed. A, B, C, always. Remember, if there is a pulse, A, B, C. If there is no pulse, C, A, B. Okay? So that is as simple as that. Can we hyperventilate in case of hypercarbia? I think... If there is hypercarbia, see, the goal is keep... Uh, Keep the PCO2 between 35 and 40, okay? Uh, you can go up to 45 if, the, if there is no uh, massive head injury. So uh, it is not called hyperventilation. It is called maintaining normocardia. Normally, when a patient comes to you, this patient is up and there, usually you will get a high PCO2 because your breathing is compromised. So in that case, 
to bring down the PCO2 to normal, you may have to give a little higher respiratory rate, either by bag mask if you are using an NIV or intubation and IPTV. But hyperventilation is not to be done routinely in a case of head injury because even in a head injury, you have to maintain the PCO2 at the normal level. If you bring down the PCO2, then you will be causing more ischemia and more damage to the brain. Mm -hmm. So remember, hyperventilation in head injury is done in very select cases only when there is an impending coding. How do you know there is an impending coding? Your GPS will come down to 3. There will be high bradycardia. The blood pressure will start falling. That means your brain stem has been affected and the patient is going to be brain dead or is going to have a coning. So in that case, as an emergency measure, you give a hyperventilation and bring down uh, the PCO2, but never bring it down below 25 because then it will be counterproductive. So that is the only scenario where you go for a hyperventilation. It was a very informative lecture. I mean, great detail. You took it in a very systematic manner covered it very very well i think it is it must be very much clear to all the residents who attended this yeah uh, the idea is to give them a systematic approach yes but it will be clear as they go on practicing it so this is something this is just like a cardiac arrest the more you give the more you know so you have to keep on practicing because trauma is so important uh, you need to know how to handle a trauma so i think uh, i have been able to clarify some of the doubts and this is just uh, inspiration to further reading and to go for further uh, practices and courses. That's all. Definitely. I think we can give a chance to, if they can, they want to have a direct interaction so they can interact with Madam. Uh, there's a possibility to unmute everybody now. So anybody can now unmute and if there is a one. One or two quick questions that can be asked to uh, Dr. Vinita Panikar. So, uh, thank you, Madam. You have been very elaborate over the last uh, one and a half hours or so. And uh, uh, just on the lighter side, please do have a good cup of tea or coffee. And uh, uh, it was a pleasure having you here. For the benefit of the house, uh, this uh, recording of this class is available on ISA YouTube channel, ISA NHQ, and on ISA website www.isaweb.in uh, under the ISA Academics tab. Uh, see you all next Monday uh, for the class on anesthetic concerns in robotic surgery by Dr. Deepak Mistri from Gujarat. Thank you very much. Have a good day.